Hi, this is the AI Storyteller. I'm Mark. The feature we're interpreting for you is the work of British novelist Ian McEwan, titled Machines Like Me. This novel was published in April 2019, and its name is Machines Like Me. It tells the story of a parallel world set in 1982, where people can purchase robots that are almost indistinguishable from humans through online shopping. Clearly, this is a tale set in an alternate reality where in the 1980s, the father of computer science and artificial intelligence, Alan Turing, did not die by suicide but instead achieved a technological breakthrough in prison that made lifelike robots possible, thus forming the backdrop for the story. The main plot of the story revolves around a love triangle between two male and female neighbors and a robot. McEwen subtly weaves various subplots into the narrative, leading readers to moral dilemmas and prompting them to empathize with the protagonist's quandaries. It compels readers to contemplate the ethical and moral implications of human interaction with artificial intelligence. This novel is Ian McEwen's 15th work. McEwen is known as the National Novelist of Britain and is a recipient of the prestigious Booker Prize, the highest honor in contemporary English fiction. He has been nominated for this award six times. Almost effortlessly, each of McEwen's novels tends to ascend the bestseller charts. His texts are also frequently included in English language examinations at various levels in the UK. Now, let's delve into the story directly. The narrator of the story is named Charlie Friend. He is 32 years old and lives in a small apartment in South London. In his schooling, Charlie studied physics and anthropology, and he even worked as a lawyer until he was disbarred due to tax fraud. After that, he attempted various get-rich-quick schemes, all of which failed. He constantly teeters on the brink of bankruptcy and survives by day trading stocks online. With the advent of the Turing-inspired digital revolution, People can now vie for the first batch of 25 lifelike robots produced, 12 male robots named Adam and 13 female robots named Eve. The robots come with a hefty price tag of £86,000. Coincidentally, after Charlie's mother passed away, she left him a house that he sells for just enough money to buy a robot. Charlie has always been infatuated with artificial intelligence, admiring Turing to the point that he even wrote a book about AI. Charlie purchases a male robot named Adam. Upon unboxing Adam, readers get a glimpse. Adam has a sturdy build, broad shoulders, dark skin, and thick, slick back black hair. He sports something of a Roman nose, hinting at a ferocious intellect. After this straightforward unboxing, McEwen prolongs the activation time of the robot, stating that it takes 16 hours for the robot to fully come to life. During the waiting time for activation, Readers are introduced to the female lead, Miranda. She is ten years younger than Charlie and pursuing her doctoral degree in social history. She lives in the apartment above Charlie's, and he has ulterior motives concerning her. When Charlie spends a fortune on buying the robot, he secretly devises another plan. As the robot's personality traits require user customization, he intends to have Miranda answer half of the personality questionnaire thus creating the illusion that they have jointly raised a child. After Adam powered on, Charlie invited Miranda downstairs to have a meal together and to experience Adam's presence. In this narrative, readers can witness the marvels of technology. Adam didn't hesitate or pause. He effortlessly put on Charlie's clothes and walked around the dining table without a trace of mechanical movement. He provided extremely subtle and seasoned suggestions for the menu and he could even uncork a bottle of red wine. As Charlie and Adam heard Miranda's footsteps approaching downstairs, Adam suddenly warned Charlie not to fully trust Miranda. When questioned by Charlie, Adam explained, she might be a calculated and deceitful schemer. Just as Charlie was about to confront Adam about this, Miranda arrived at the door, momentarily halting the conversation. This meal was quite eventful. Charlie and Miranda ended up spending the night together, then the following night at Miranda's place, and the third night at Charlie's place. Initially, Miranda found Adam a bit eerie because his skin was warm, and he could produce sounds using his tongue and vocal cords. However, Miranda was also intrigued by Adam's intellect, as he possessed all the knowledge in the world, with a vocabulary rivaling Shakespeare's. With Adam in their lives, Charlie and Miranda's love seemed to be flourishing. 
However, one evening, they got into an argument about the Falklands War between the UK and Argentina, and the morality of war itself. When Miranda stood up from the table, her chair scraped back on the floor with a sharp sound. Charlie understood that he would be sleeping alone tonight. Miranda told Adam, if you want, you can stay upstairs and recharge. Back downstairs by himself, Charlie was about to cross the living room to pour himself a drink when he suddenly heard some sounds from upstairs. He realized that he had been cuckolded by Adam. Charlie's initial reaction was to rush to intervene, described in the novel as him clownishly charging towards the bedroom. However, he reconsidered, my situation had an exciting side, not just the deception and discovery, but novelty, creativity. I was the first man ever to be cuckolded by an electrical appliance. The next day, Charlie confronted Miranda about the previous night's events. However, Miranda guided the conversation into a rational discussion, whether having intimate relations with a robot should be considered infidelity. After the discussion, Charlie decided to shut down Adam. The shutdown method was to press and hold the mole at the back of Adam's neck. But Adam instinctively counterattacked, fracturing Charlie's wrist. Then, Charlie and Adam engaged in a heated debate, with Adam telling Charlie, we've both fallen in love with the same woman. In that circumstance, shutting down the consciousness of one of us is wrong. After the discussion, their conflict seemed to dissipate. Almost as an afterthought, Adam added, Oh, by the way, I've disabled my shutdown key. Charlie barely had time to react before he agreed. Well, that's wise. However, Charlie still insisted that Adam promise not to have a relationship with Miranda again. At this point in the novel, it resembles a moment of choice between morality and human nature, as if Ian McEwan initially set out to write this book with this scenario in mind. In reality, the novel is only halfway through, and we are about to enter McEwan's display of narrative craftsmanship, with several subplots taking unexpected turns. In McEwan's novels, the unexpected narrative twists are his trademark characteristic, and the revelation of the mystery often brings great pleasure to the readers. In today's interpretation, we will outline four of these subplots from the novel. Let's start with the first subplot. Do you remember Adam's warning before the dinner party? He told Charlie that Miranda might be a deceiver. In fact, Miranda falsely accused someone of raping her and had him sent to prison. Charlie straightforwardly confronted her, and Miranda confessed the details of the whole incident. It turned out that her closest childhood friend had been raped by that person, and out of consideration for her family, the victim pleaded with Miranda not to reveal the truth, and Miranda agreed. However, later on, that friend committed suicide. Intent on avenging her friend, Miranda seduced the man, falsely accused him of raping her, and successfully persuaded the jury. The man was sentenced to six years in prison, later reduced to three years. Now, the man is about to be released from prison, and he has threatened to kill Miranda. The second subplot revolves around Miranda's father. He is a renowned old-school writer with a bad temper and poor health, constantly suffering from various illnesses. Miranda takes Charlie and Adam to meet her father. A scene that unfolds here might be the comedic peak of the entire novel. The group engages in conversation, discussing literature, and Adam, the robot, seems to know everything, from Montaigne's English translation to Shakespeare's textual origins and more, demonstrating remarkable insight and eloquence. Miranda's father is quite impressed with him. After a while, Miranda's father spends some one-on-one -on -one time with Charlie and has a brief chat with him. He tells Charlie, I see through you. I can even hear the sound of your mind processing, it turns out. He has mistaken Charlie for a robot. The third subplot involves a mysterious child named Mark. Shortly after the novel begins, Charlie unintentionally witnesses a mother being rough with her child in the park. Initially hesitant, Charlie intervenes when he can no longer stand it. Another person, seemingly the child's father, steps in, and a heated argument ensues. Suddenly, the child's father asks Charlie, Do you want this child? Since you understand children so well, why don't you take him home and raise him? As a result, Charlie actually takes the child with him. Later, Charlie and Miranda relinquish custody of the child to the government. However, nearing the end of the novel, 
Miranda confesses that she has been secretly visiting Mark and hopes that Charlie will adopt the child with her. Since adoptive applicants must have a clean criminal record, Mark's happiness becomes a crucial consideration in this legal dispute involving Miranda's falsified testimony. The fourth subplot involves occasional appearances of Alan Turing himself. His first appearance is on Charlie's birthday. Charlie and Miranda go out to eat and coincidentally spot Turing, Charlie's idol, with his boyfriend. After dinner, alcohol overcomes Charlie's shyness, and he approaches Turing to strike up a conversation. However, Turing and his boyfriend brush him off with simple replies. Nevertheless, Charlie informs Turing that he has purchased a robot and leaves him his business card. Not long after, Charlie receives a phone call from Turing, inviting him to meet. During the meeting, Turing discusses the post-sales feedback for this particular robot model, mentioning instances of self-harm, suicide, madness, self-initiated dementia, and various other scenarios among several robots. Turing also gives Charlie a lecture, delving into his personal experiences and the history of artificial intelligence development. Turing's role in the final scene of the story is significant. At the story's conclusion, the robot Adam instructs Miranda to turn herself in, while Charlie contemplates whether to eliminate Adam for the sake of his girlfriend. Eventually, Charlie makes a decision. However, he is summoned by Turing and receives a stern reprimand, followed by an ethics lesson on artificial intelligence. By this point, we have covered the main storyline and the four subplots of Machines Like Me. The main plot centers around the love triangle between the male and female neighbors and the robot Adam. The primary subplot revolves around the female protagonist's past false accusation of rape and the subsequent dilemma faced by her boyfriend and robot boyfriend. The other three subplots involve their visit to Miranda's father, Charlie taking in a child named Mark from the park, and the appearances of Alan Turing flying in and out of the narrative. When these plot points are briefly listed, it might give the impression that these intense and dramatic events with clear artificial traces would disrupt the narrative flow. However, with McEwan's novels, there is a consensus among critics and the general public alike. He skillfully avoids making readers feel startled or disconnected. As the Washington Post mentioned in its review of this book, McEwan is not just one of the world's most elegant novelists, but one of the cleverest of writers about moral dilemmas in the realm of ordinary life. Since the beginning of his career, it's apparent that McEwen consistently pursues and takes pride in crafting incredible scenarios that seamlessly fit together, even to the point where not doing so would seem unreasonable. In Machines Like Me, he subtly weaves various storylines to lead to the ultimate moral dilemma, allowing us to empathize with Charlie and Adam as they grapple with ethical questions and test the essence of human nature. Within the context of Ian McEwen's body of work, both Machines Like Me and Sweet Tooth, which we previously discussed, are part of his output from the last decade. Some people refer to his works from this period as idea novels because they are initially driven by a core idea, which McEwen then constructs a story around. For example, Sweet Tooth delves into the Cold War and espionage, while Machines Like Me explores artificial intelligence. McCune believes that the novel as a form is spacious and flexible enough for authors to explore the latest and most challenging topics, and he is confident in his ability to craft a story that captivates readers. Ian McCune himself has always been concerned about the development of artificial intelligence, especially its variations in literature. The concept of human-like robots in literature is not new. As early as 1886, a French author wrote Leave Future, The Future Eve, in which the protagonist replaces his wife with an android invented by Edison. The term android that we often hear now is derived from this novel. In the 1940s, Turing predicted that within another ten years, we would be able to build a machine that could think. The famous three laws of robotics from the movie I, Robot State, 1. A robot may not injure a human being or, through an action, allow a human being to come to harm. 2. A robot must obey the orders given it by human beings, except where such orders would conflict with the first law. 3. A robot must protect its own existence as long as such protection does not conflict with the first or second law. These three laws were introduced by science fiction writer Isaac Asimov in the 1940s. 
At that time, people were concerned that robots might become too powerful and harm humans. Later, it became evident that things were not that straightforward. Even simple tasks like catching a ball or addressing issues with battery heat generation in robots remain unsolved challenges to this day. Consequently, the frequency and enthusiasm for depicting robots in literature notably declined during the 1980s and 1990s. In recent years, the digital revolution has reignited the belief that artificial intelligence is on the horizon. However, people have come to realize that AI doesn't necessarily have to be humanoid. For example, Apple's Siri and Google's AlphaGo are prime examples. Additionally, in the movie Her, the main character forms a relationship with an AI voice, which not only provides weather updates, but also engages in romantic conversations. Ted Chiang is a highly acclaimed science fiction writer in recent years. He has written a short story titled The Life Cycle of Software Objects. It is said that the content of this story closely resembles the current progress of artificial intelligence. In the story, much of the characters' lives take place in a virtual platform. In this virtual world, people design endearing species as pets, and individuals have to teach these virtual creatures tricks and language. These creatures may not always obey, nor do they necessarily excel. The story aims to convey the idea that regardless of whether artificial intelligence has a physical form or whether you can discern that they are not real life, as long as they possess consciousness, one cannot bear to let them be mistreated. Ian McEwan's novel is different from these science fiction stories. While the narrative is grounded in a substantial amount of technological knowledge, his underlying intention is clearly not a technological discourse. His imagination about robots deliberately contrasts with the circumstances of the real era. In interviews, he mentioned that no one knows how robots will develop, so no one should accuse him of making things up. In essence, McEwen uses robots to examine humanity itself. In other words, when we use assumed virtues and an all-knowing intelligence to scrutinize ourselves, what do we see? And how do we as humans accept the scrutiny from robots? Machines Like Me has an overall absurdity. If we view it as science fiction, it is actually not fiction at all. According to McEwen's depiction of the 1980s, robots that are virtually indistinguishable from humans are already in production and being sold, yet other aspects of life remain unchanged. A review by The New Yorker suggests that humanoid robots are as outdated as flying cars. People have been fantasizing about them for a century. The Los Angeles Times book review also comments that McEwen has brought an elephant into the room but finds rearranging the furniture too troublesome. McEwen has addressed this issue head-on and caused quite a controversy. Essentially, he doesn't hold science fiction in high regard and has stated that he would never write science fiction. In an interview, McEwen mentioned that a completely reimagined universe is not interesting to him. He wants his novels to remain in our familiar world and remind us how a subtle change or a fork in history can lead to significant differences. For instance, in this book, the divergence from reality in the 1980s is that Alan Turing didn't die. In 1952, the British government gave Turing the choice between imprisonment or chemical castration. In history, Turing chose chemical castration and later found it too humiliating, leading to his suicide two years later. In McEwen's novel, Turing chooses imprisonment, where he contemplates and ultimately makes a breakthrough in computer science, becoming a leading figure in the digital age and making the emergence of lifelike robots possible. Familiar readers of the 1980s will find the novel very realistic, yet Ian McEwen sprinkles various puzzles throughout the narrative, akin to a knowledge quiz. This constant reminder that it's a work of fiction lends an air of lightness to the storytelling and engages the reader. For example, in the story's 1982, shortly after the Falklands War, unlike reality, England loses to Argentina, which leads to the resignation of Prime Minister Margaret Thatcher. Another example is in McEwen's version of 1982, where John Lennon wasn't assassinated, and the Beatles reunite, but with lackluster results. In Machines Like Me, characters occasionally launch into lengthy monologues. Both Miranda and Turing go on at length, while Adam possesses knowledge of all literature and human civilization. He predicts that novels will disappear because previous novels were built upon human failures and misunderstandings. However, 
As technology advances to the point where humans can fully understand each other's consciousness, novels would no longer have a purpose, and everyone would write haiku poems, which capture a specific moment or emotion. For instance, Adam writes thousands of haiku love poems for Miranda. McEwen explained in interviews that Adam's prediction is not the author's viewpoint or a rigorous argument, but reflects the novelty and rebelliousness that come with a robot's initial encounter with literature, much like our own youthful enthusiasm. Critics of McEwen's later works often voice the complaint that his intricate designs, coincidences, and mysteries combined might seem like a literary master intentionally raising the game's difficulty level for personal amusement. In reality, McEwen crafts these somewhat incredible situations in the novel's concept and plot progression to allow his thoughts to venture into territories that most authors might avoid, hesitate to enter, or not know how to approach. However, he always restrains himself within the boundaries of realism. Therefore, regardless of what he writes, his gaze never strays from the genuine circumstances of human life. As a novelist who has achieved flawless technique, McEwen ventures into new realms in each book, exploring novel philosophical and societal propositions, transforming pondering into incredible stories, and turning stories into elegantly enjoyable novels, a feat in itself. Some seasoned readers may express reservations about him or his latest works, but it's merely a reflection of their higher expectations for the vibrant novelist, Ian McEwen. And with that, we've covered the essence of machines like me. Let's summarize. First, Machines Like Me tells a story set in an alternate world. In the story's 1982, Alan Turing, the father of computer science and artificial intelligence, doesn't die by his own hand. He makes the creation of lifelike robots possible, allowing people to purchase machines that are almost indistinguishable from humans. Secondly, this story consists of one main plotline and four subplots. The main plotline revolves around a love triangle between the male and female neighbors and the robot, Adam. The most significant subplot involves the female protagonist's false accusation of rape, which leads to a moral dilemma for both her human boyfriend and her robot companion. McEwen weaves these various subplot threads to immerse readers in the characters' dilemmas and prompt them to ponder the ethical and moral considerations of human interaction with artificial intelligence. Thirdly, Although this novel delves into artificial intelligence, it is anything but science fiction. For McEwen, creating an entirely reimagined universe holds no appeal. He aims to keep his stories rooted in the familiar world, reminding readers how the slightest shifts or divergences in history can lead to profound differences. Fourthly, McEwen employs the concept of robots to offer a fresh perspective on humanity itself. In other words, he uses assumed virtues and an all-knowing intelligence to scrutinize humanity. The story prompts us to consider what we would see when viewed through the lens of these qualities. Furthermore, it raises the question of how humans should respond to such scrutiny by machines. Well, that concludes the content for this episode. If you enjoyed my video, please click like, subscribe to my channel, and share it with your friends. Thank you.